Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. So, fun topic today. Today's topic is the a program that we call the ACDC. We call it that for exactly two reasons. First reason is because it rocks. The second reason is because the letters, Airman's Continuous Development Cycle, they start with ACDC. So, a little bit of an acronym. We love it. So, what are we trying to do here? Uh, here. Barbara's going to scroll for me just a little bit, about one page. And what we're going to try to do is, rather than reinvent the wheel when it comes to enlisted force development, when it comes to how we lead and develop future NCOs, what we're going to do is we're going to take the existing process and we're going to augment it with some tools. We're going to build on what we already have and we're going to try to make it a lot better. And so you can read here, we've got kind of four items. We're going to order the existing uh, assessment tools, right? The Air Force gives us some assessment tools, the EPR, the uh, ACA, things like that. Um, so we're going to try to put them into a logical sequence of evaluation, give them a, a defined start, uh, and, and I'll say endpoint, although it's circular, so it's a start and start over. We want to make sure that performance feedback is continuous throughout the process. Feedback that we've gotten, not just from this unit, but across the wing, across the state, and across the guard, is that we have a lot of airmen that show up at drill to go, oh, I have an EPR due. Oh man, I haven't thought about that since my last one. Worse yet, we have a lot of NCOs that show up and go, oh, my airman's got an EPR due. I haven't put any thought into that since the last one. So rather than these things being a point in time event where we think about development, we think about evaluation as a point in time event, we want to take this and make it a continuous process and keep people engaged throughout that two-year cycle. We want to add depth to it. Let's, let's be honest. All right, show of hands, who had a great experience with their last ACA and walked away from it feeling like, oh man, I, I grew as a person and a professional? I'm the only hand up. We want to change that. We want to make sure that that ACA, that EPR, that we're doing, not just giving feedback, but giving meaningful feedback. We think we've got some tools to help supervisors do that effectively. We want to establish functional alignment between goals, performance, evaluation, feedback. We want to take all of this and line it up. Now here's the fun part. We, we give feedback, we perform, we have evaluations. Right now goals is missing as a formal part of the process. And so that's really where this entire cycle came from is the realization that we've got a middle and we've got an end, but the, the beginning, we're not really setting ourselves up for success. So the ACDC is going to address that for us. We scroll down just a little bit. How are we going to do all those things? We're going to do those things by incorporating seven tools into our continuous process. Some of these you already know, you're familiar with them, the Air Force has given them to us. Others you've seen other places, academia or maybe your civilian careers. The first is the Air Force Form 174 Record of Individual Counseling. Definitely a familiar item for folks in this particular unit because we've used it to document um, our goals, our objectives, we've used it to, for positive purposes in the past. A lot of other folks though, they know this because um, the record of individual counseling is actually in an AFI uh, that's called negative personnel actions. All right, so it sounds a little bit ominous, it gets kind of a bad rap, uh, but the use that we have for it here is actually outlining expectations, capturing those big rocks, these are your deliverables, this is what you owe us. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, a SWOT analysis. Show of hands, who's familiar with the SWOT? All right, most folks in the room. A lot of colleges have started having their freshmen do SWATs when they arrive on campus. A lot of companies have folks do SWATs when they begin a, a performance cycle or begin a new calendar year. And the reason is it's a, it's a self-assessment tool for understanding your operating environment and how you fit into it. Fun tool, actually. The enlisted scorecard. Who knows the, the enlisted scorecard? All right, fewer folks. Scorecard's been around. It's probably about 10 to 15 years old. It was created by the Enlisted Field Advisory Council. Uh, that's, that's a uh, group of chiefs that gets together, kind of like a think tank. and comes up with ways to improve the force. So scorecard's going to serve a very similar purpose to us as our SWAT does. What the scorecard's going to do, though, is it's going to take those same thoughts and it's going to focus them in terms of a career rather than a broad whole person perspective. SMART goals. Uh, I have up here SMART goals worksheet, but who knows the, the concept of SMART goals? Okay. 
This is another one that we've stolen from industry. It's very popular with a lot of companies out there that they require if you're going to make a goal, you're going to do it in the SMART goal format. Uh, even the Boy Scouts teach the SMART goal format. Fun story, your ACA form, actually uh, somewhere towards the bottom, it does say, hey, consider writing SMART goals. Now, it doesn't really tell you what that is or how to do it, but the Air Force endorses the concepts. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide folks with a little bit of education on what SMART means as an acronym and what a SMART goal looks like. For now, and we'll get into it in a few minutes, but for now, just know that the difference between a SMART goal and a dumb goal isn't just how much thought you put into it. The SMART format means you're writing your goal in a way that is designed to help you achieve it. The ACA, the Airman's Comprehensive Assessment, all right, we've all been subject to an ACA at some point. I'm seeing a lot of nodding and not a lot of smiling. We'll fix that, don't worry. Measures of success tool, the most. I know in this flight, you have seen the most in multiple formats over the years as it has grown and evolved. The format that you're gonna see today is its final version. It is very different than what most of you have experienced at different points in time. Um, this is the, the version that was designed specifically to fit into this ACA process. And we'll take a, a deeper dive at that uh, in a little bit. The Enlisted Performance Report, EPR. Everybody's had an EPR at some point, right? Yeah, lots of, lots of nodding, slightly more smiling than with the ACA. We understand why we do. Some of the, uh, some of the older folks in the unit, they're gonna remember a time where the guard did not do EPRs. And, I mean, let's be honest, everything we've ever done there's an evaluation involved. Every job you've ever had, you know, working at, working at the uh, ice cream shop in the summers when you were in high school, they still evaluate you at the end of the summer. So we know we have to evaluate. We know that Big Air Force, their language of evaluation is the EPR, right? We are always working with them, engaging with them. So it makes sense that if we have to evaluate, we're gonna evaluate their way. Now they do it more frequently. Ours is on a two-year cycle. And that's actually what's going to drive the two-year clock on the ACDC here. So let's go ahead and go next slide, please, Barbara. So he, he might have to zoom out just a little bit, but we're going to put figure one on screen. Don't worry about the words. I'm not going to read them to you. You guys have a copy. If you don't, uh, you can pull one off of SharePoint. That's fine. But uh, this wheel, go ahead and scroll just so we can get the whole thing in. A little more. All right, I know it's a little tough to see, so I'm going to walk you through it. This wheel, figure one, basically captures the big rocks of the process as it exists today. These are kind of the generalized expectations for developing airmen and, and this APA or ACA EPR cycle that we go through. And so theoretically, it starts with the silver bubble out here, assigned to a new unit section or position some major change in what you do here. Cool, what does that trigger? That triggers, triggers the purple bubble, and that's responsibilities and expectations. All right, you guys are, are, are fast burners here, so you know that somebody says, hey, I've got a new job for you. The first thought is, okay, what's expected of me in this role? What am I accountable for? What am I responsible for? And in some way, that generally gets conveyed. But we're gonna go from that now all you superstar troops, you're gonna say, I know what's expected of me. This blue bubble, if I know what's expected of me, I'm gonna set goals for myself because I'm gonna meet or exceed expectations. Once we've done that, that's gonna take us into a performance period where we're gonna act on those goals, try to accomplish them, try to meet those responsibilities and expectations. And then again, we're gonna assume kind of a normative cycle here. We'll say roughly 12 months later, we come out at the ACA. We've got our Airman's Comprehensive Assessment where we sit down with our supervisor and we talk about how's it going. We roll through another performance cycle, roughly 12 months, again on a normative scale here, and that's gonna take us to the red bubble, that's the EPR. We complete our EPR, process starts over. Probably the first time you've seen it captured in a chart, but I'm gonna guess this sounds very familiar. Generally, this is-ish what we do. So let's scroll down because we're going to build on this. So Barbara going down to figure two. It's going to look just like figure one with some additions. So like I said, we don't want to reinvent this wheel. What we want to do is build on it. And if you can plus up your zoom just one notch there. So again, silver bubble, 
assigned to new unit, section, or position. What's the first thing you need to know? You need to know what your responsibilities and expectations are in that unit or in that position. Now, we're going to add that second bubble on there. We're going to capture that. We're going to document that. We're going to use the Air Force Form 174 to document what those responsibilities and expectations are. So that six months later, 18 months later, you don't come into drill and go, am I doing everything I'm supposed to be doing? Am I meeting my, my supervisor's expectations? Am I juggling this the right way? Okay? We want it written down. We don't want our airmen ever to feel like they're hanging out there in limbo, where they're not really sure of what is expected of them. So we owe it to them to put it on paper. Okay? That next bubble, that the blue bubble, individual goal setting. So now I know what's expected of me. I'm going to set some goals. Okay? We're going to arm them with some tools for doing that effectively. We're going to give them the SWOT analysis. We're going to give them the enlisted scorecard. We're going to give them um, the SMART goals worksheet to help them develop their goals into a SMART format that makes it more likely that they actually achieve them. And we're going to look at each one of these tools individually here once we finish walking the process. Once we leave that, we go down into our performance period. We've got a second bubble there just to shout out to supervisors to make sure we remain directly engaged, that we're coaching and mentoring throughout. It's not like we set them up for success on day one and then we just step away until it's time to evaluate them. And that's going to bring us to our orange bubble at the 6 o'clock position, the Airman's Comprehensive Assessment. All right, I noticed nobody put their hand up when I said who got something good out of their last ACA. That is a huge problem. There are two points in a two-year cycle where we really provide formal feedback and formal evaluation. We need to be getting something out of those. And so what we've done is we've, we've taken the ACA, okay, that's going to be a part of it, and we're going to supplement it with a few things. When we come around on our ACA now, we're going to pull out that SWOT analysis, the SMART Goals Worksheet, and the Enlisted Scorecard from way back when we started, this, started the wheel. And we're also going to take out this, this Measures of Success tool, this MOST, that's a locally developed product for the 179th. And what it's going to do is it has become a supervisor's conversation guide. We have taken well, primarily from the Little Brown Book, uh, the enlisted force structure, and we've taken definition of all of these different terms. And we've made sure that when we converse with our airmen, when we talk about things like leadership, we're doing it with the Air Force's definition of leadership. When we talk about followership, we're doing it with the Air Force's definition of followership. We want to have in-depth conversations that lead to the right outcomes, that provide meaningful engagement. And I think you'll see that when we get there. So we come out of our ACA, we go back into our performance period, where as supervisors, we continue to coach and mentor, and that's going to bring us up to the EPR. Now, who's had the experience where you come in one drill and it's, oh, I've got, I've got an airman that needs an EPR today. Anybody have that happen where it just falls out of the sky? So we've definitely seen that more than a few times. And it's kind of this scramble. Hey, Jimmy, fill this out. Tell me what you did over the last two years. I don't know. Something. So what we've got to work from now is we've got all of that previous documentation that's a part of the development cycle that we can pull out. We've got an ACA that actually has meaningful information in it out. And oh, by the way, I'm going to let you guys kind of, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and I'll circle back. If you set five or six goals for yourself at the beginning of this period and you achieve four or five of them, that's four or five ready-made bullets for the EPR at the end of the cycle. So rather than scrambling around trying to figure out what you did, it just got easier because you did what you said you were going to do. All you have to do now is put it on the sheet. And so once we get through that EPR, and I'm, actually, let me go back to that for one second. There's one other note up there under the EPR. As a guard, we've traditionally not done a great job of recognizing our people, wards and decks. Right? Active duty, they do, they do it pretty regularly. The guard, for whatever reason, we've struggled with that. So we want to make it a point that when someone's EPR comes due as a supervisor, that is a golden opportunity to consider if they deserve recognition through awards and decks. You've got two years' worth of achievements laid out in front of you. It doesn't get any easier than that. That's, that's the time to look at it and go, okay, is something merited or is it not? And so we want that to be an automatic marker to consider recognition. That doesn't mean that recognition is considered automatic. But that's the time to stop and look because your job will never be easier than when you've got all that laid out in front of you. So once we get there, it's been two years 
It's time to reevaluate those responsibilities and expectations. Pull out that 174. Okay, is this stuff still valid? Have things changed? Do I just need to reaffirm it and move, on, move forward? Or do we need to make some tweaks? That's the time to look at it. And the wheel starts over. Uh, Barbara, can you go down, please? Figure three. All right, so when you look at figure three, you're gonna realize the reason we've kind of done this building approach is because if I had led with this one, you would have all tuned out right off the bat. So it looks more complicated than it is, but really what we have is we've got that first wheel, the big rocks. Nothing's changed, those are the big rocks. We've got the inner wheel. Okay, those are the tools that we're laying on top of these big rocks to support them. We've got the wheel of arrows on the inside. Look, we're, we wanna stay on top of things. We wanna remind folks coaching and mentoring is a continuous process. We don't disengage. We don't only get involved when we have a form to fill out. We stay with our airmen. Around the outside, you've got this, this black dodecahedron, hexagon, something. And uh, what you see on the outside of it is measures of time. What we've done is we've used the EPR as our marker of time. And so if you look by the red bubble, what you see is EPR plus zero, EPR minus 24. That red bubble is the EPR, so you are in the EPR. That is zero months since your last one, because you're in it, and 24 months until your next one. So that's how that wheel works going around the outside. Now you'll notice that is estimated time because the performance period, the period between EPR and ACA is 12 months, but it kind of, that performance, that green bubble would cover 12 on its own. It's because you're still performing while you're setting your goals. You're still performing while the expectations are being discussed. So there's a little bit of overlap, overlap there. That's relative time. So please don't get hung up on the, the numbers going around the outside. The other numbers, what you see in these little black hexagons, are different parts of this process. We've actually done time studies, where we have taken airmen, we've taken NCOs, we took first sergeant, we've had people fill these things out, and we timed them. We, they didn't know they were being timed, but we were timing them. We wanted to see how long it actually takes to complete these tasks. And so what you see going around the outside, those black boxes, that is how long it takes somebody to do these tasks the second time through. First time, it's a little janky, all right? It's a little sloppy, it takes a little longer. But once you've been through it once, this is the time on average it takes to do that. Now that's not the additional time compared to whatever we're doing today, that's the total time. So if we get down here to the ACA, if your ACA is currently taking you an hour, we're not adding 90 minutes to that hour. This is 90 minutes flat. Over the course of two years, this represents a five hour investment in the development of our airmen. Our airmen are worth that. They're worth a lot more than that, but we do have to balance operational needs and other things. So this is our baseline. This is what we're looking to guarantee our airmen is we will give you five hours of commitment where we are gonna make sure that these things happen to help progress you forward. All right, if you can click at the top for me, click on the ACDC appendices. We're gonna talk about these tools now that you, you heard about. The first one we're gonna look at is the Air Force Form 174. I've got two examples of the 174. And as we scroll down, all right, this is the first one. So I'm an OSU guy, you're gonna get some OSU references in here. All right, I'm sure you all catch down at the bottom this, uh, this NCOIC that is filling this out, this Master Sergeant Jesse Owens. It's a good Ohio State name right there. But uh, Sergeant Owens has inherited, he just received uh, this, this Laura Califatis, uh, another good OSU name if anybody follows Ohio State women's softball. But uh, Sergeant Califatis just arrived on station, newly assigned to section, and Sergeant Owens is gonna sit her down. He's gonna say, look, hey, number one, welcome to the unit, number two, these are the expectations. This is, these are your major deliverables in your new role. And so if you can scroll down for me um, just a little bit there. All right, so this is not a template. This is not to be used word for word, but it's gonna give you an idea of the things that you wanna document in here for your member. So number one, you're assigned as the supervisor for the following airmen. I'm giving you these two troops. You've got Senior Airman Hayes, and you've got Airman Brown. Yeah, and these are your folks, take care of them. Right off the bat, these are the people assigned. I know who they are, I know who I am accountable for. Number two, you have ownership of corrosion control, anti-electrostatic discharge programs. Here's two programs that you own. These are yours, take them. 
Number three, you're being assigned responsibility for the Prick 152. You guys know I'm a radio guy in a former life, so you're going to see some references there as well. Prick 152 is a radio, and uh, you've got responsibility for it. You and your airmen, you own everything about it. Number four, you're also in charge of the base antenna cleaning program. There is no base antenna cleaning program in real life. I just like saying that it aligns with your other duties. Tough crowd. Okay, so the idea here though is tech sergeant, welcome. Here's everything you own. Here it is laid out. So six months from now, you can pull this out. This is, these are the big rocks that I'm accountable for. It is not 100% of everything. There's always other duties as assigned, other responsibilities as they pop up. But here's the core of what I need you to do. And if we scroll down to block nine, we have an opportunity for the supervisor right up there, right? Oh, freeze. For the supervisor to say, and by the way, here's some philosophy. And this goes back to us as NCOs engaging with our airmen. We've walked the road that they want to walk someday. Okay? Share your wisdom, share your philosophy, share your thoughts. Yeah, that's what block nine is for right there. Let's go ahead and scroll down to the second one now. So as Tech Sergeant Califatis, I've just received my instructions from my Master Sergeant. I'm gonna obviously take those and break them down for my Airman. And so if we scroll down just a little bit here, I've got Airman Hayes, and I'm gonna break it down for my Airman in exactly the same way. I'm gonna pull out a 174, and give me all of Block 8, please. All right, so I'm gonna start, and this is why we're talking about this. You're coming off of an EPR, you had a great EPR. Let's keep the momentum going. Number one, when Airman Brown gets back from tech school, I need your help training him, all right? You're not a trainer. This is not an Airman assigned to you, but I wanna help prepare you for future responsibilities, so I'm gonna engage you in this activity. Number two, I own two programs, Corrosion Control and Anti-ESD. You're right here. You're right on the cusp of being ready to be an NCO, so I'm putting one of them on your plate. You're gonna take this program, and you're gonna own it. Come to me if you need anything, but be entrepreneurial here. Own it start to finish. Number three, I'm giving you responsibility for the PRIC 152 PMI program. Okay? I own the 152, but I'm taking this one component of it, the preventative maintenance inspections, and I'm putting them on your plate. You're responsible for those. Number four, look, we've got this antenna cleaning thing that we're gonna do. We're gonna go out and make sure all the antennas are clean. In order for you to do this uh, responsibility that's not really made clear in your CFETP, this responsibility that's not necessarily a given at every shop that does what we do, I've got a kind of a unique AFJQS that I need you to go out and do. This is training above and beyond. I don't want to document every CFETP task, but if I've got something that's really unique tied to a specific person or a specific duty position, I'm going to call it out. And then finally, Another one of those unofficial jobs. You've been working as our job controller. You've been monitoring the tickets. You've been uh, assigning them off to other folks in the section and making sure that they get closed. Keep that up, all right? I'm just gonna document it here because you're the guy that's been doing it. Let's make sure you get credit for it. So if we scroll down, we've got block nine. When we hit block nine, again, philosophy. Philosophy and coaching. So I would encourage you to keep your block nines mostly positive. Don't shy away though, if you need to give somebody a nudge on something, okay, put it in there. But this is where we can document some coaching and some mentoring, and that's the whole point of this form. So here's your big rocks, here's your major deliverables, the things that you own. Here's my thoughts on it. Go get it done. Before we move on, any questions on the 174s? Why we, why we think this is a good idea, what it's intended to do, anything on the 174s. All right, I'm seeing head nodding. It's all in the right direction, so we're gonna move on. Um, next one, please. All right, I need you to rotate that. All right, so we talked a little bit about the SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and to view. Uh, here you go. There you go. All right, so this is the SWOT analysis, and 
the way that the SWOT works is, like I said, this is meant for some introspection. This is to give you situational awareness on yourself and your operating environment. Uh, what you see is actually one of my SWATs. Go ahead and zoom out, maybe one, maybe two, two things to get it all on here. I'm a pretty open book, so I'm gonna put my stuff out there for you guys. Um, but the way this is organized is across the top, you have internal factors, things that are unique to the individual, things that come from within you or the person that the SWAT is about. Across the bottom, you have external factors, things that come from without, things that maybe are not being generated by you, but that you have to respond and react to. Left-hand column are positive attributes, strengths on top, weak, uh, opportunities on bottom. Right-hand column is what we generally consider to be negative attributes. Weaknesses on top, threats on bottom. So the four square grid that this gives us, if we start with strengths, the question is, what are your strengths? What characteristics, what qualities, what tools that you have are you gonna call on when you need to get a win? I, I like to tell folks that your strengths, if you had one pitch to close out game seven of the World Series, are you throwing your fastball or are you throwing your curveball? The answer is your strength. We identify our strengths because we want to put ourselves in opportunities to use them. We want to look for ways to play to those strengths. First step is identifying them and knowing what they are. To the right then, we have weaknesses. I'm going to be honest, that's the easiest one for me to fill out. There's just so much to choose from. But weaknesses, we want to identify them for two reasons. The first reason is we don't want to put ourselves in, an, in a situation where we're trying to call on something that we're not good at to get a win. If, if I'm terrible at something, I'm not gonna go, oh, I'll do that for the whole wing. Okay, I'm setting myself up for failure. That's number one. So avoiding our weaknesses is, is a valid reason. The other reason is we're gonna look for opportunities to address our weaknesses, to improve them and to grow through them. Okay, what's the difference between a weakness that you want to avoid and a weakness that you want to address? Typically, it's gonna be the impact if you fail. Okay, if, you, if you're going, oh, this could affect lives or equipment, okay, probably not the right moment to address that weakness. If you look at it, go low risk, but good opportunity for growth, okay, that's when we're gonna to try to address that. So, you know, I've, like I said, you have to be honest with this too. That's part of why I share mine. You know, mine are pretty, pretty obvious. I think there's probably gonna be a lot of head nodding because you guys know me, but all right, look, I get pulled away. I, I don't show up for meetings, I get pulled into other meetings. That, I think that shows disrespect for people. I need to fix that. There's a couple areas of Tom that I need to be more technically competent than I am. It's something I'm working on actively. PT test. Look, you guys know me. I live in that like 75 to 82 zone. And talking about it is what keeps me on the right side of it. And then DTS. If there's anybody in this room that thinks they're worse at DTS than I am, I will fight you for it. All right? That's not a strength of mine. Working to get better. So if we scroll down just a tad, let's talk about opportunities. Opportunities is tough, and as NCOs, this is a block that we need to engage our airmen because you've walked where they want to walk. You've, you've worn the ranks they want to wear, and so you know what's over that next hill because you've been there. But it's hard to see what's over that next hill until you've been there, so they may not be aware of all of the opportunities that are coming at them in the near future or the midterm future. So one, one thing that's uh, kind of funny is picture, we've all, been, we've all been a one or a two striper at some point in our career, right? How much did you know about being a staff sergeant when you were a one or a two striper? How much did you know about the educational opportunities, about the training that was available, about deployments? How much did you know about that stuff when you were a two striper? Now that you're a four or five striper, whatever the case may be, this is a great time to talk to those younger folks and go, hey, when you hear these things, when these things come up, this is why it's good. This is the advantage of doing that. Oh, if you do this, also do this. Lay it out for them. Help them to understand what's coming. It doesn't just apply to our junior airmen either. I can tell you right now, I've got a couple things on there with Selmo, uh, Senior Enlisted Leadership uh, Leader Management Office. If I had known more about some of the very competitive Selmo offerings when I was a Master Sergeant that I wasn't eligible for as a Master Sergeant, I would have done things differently to make myself a better candidate now that I'm a senior. So it doesn't stop just because you come and become an NCO or a senior NCO. You always need someone who's walked that path to tell you what the next steps look like. And then if we go over to threats, 
All right, threats are the exact opposite of opportunities. These are things that are gonna come at you potentially. They could really derail your plans. You could kind of throw things for a loop. And, you know, our jobs, our civilian life, that can present threats. Militarily, we find threats. Um, and, and I'll point out the last bullet here. I've got Nick and Becky, uh, Senior Mass Sergeants Orwell and, and Nyshwander called out by name on mine. It's not that I think Becky is gonna sneak up on me and slip my throat one of these days. I've probably given her plenty of reason to do it. But I know that if a chief spot were to open up, I know who my competition is. I know who's setting the bar, who I have to keep pace with in order to be competitive. So threat doesn't always mean it's going to you know, destroy you or, or loss of life in aircraft type of situation. This is a career threat, a threat to your plan. If they, if they outpace me by too much, I'll be trailing them and I won't be competitive. So when you put all this together, the goal is that it gives you a good situational picture. You can look at it and go, okay, I put the thought in, I now understand how my pieces fit together. Any questions on the SWOT analysis? Okay, if you've got a packet here in the room, you've got a SWOT analysis in there, we're not gonna fill them out right now, but I would encourage you, fill it out. And like I was saying with the, the weaknesses in particular, be honest with yourself. Make sure that you're, you know, if, if you can't, the weakness that you can't list is the one that you will never address. So let's go ahead and scroll down. And you're gonna to wanna to rotate it back. Uh, pass this one, this is the blank. And this is gonna take us to the enlisted scorecard. And we're gonna rotate that back to a vertical orientation. So, like I said, the enlisted scorecard's actually been out for quite a while. It's a really interesting document in that when they rolled it out, there wasn't a ton of guidance on how to use it. And so a lot of folks have, have kind of come up with some novel ways of doing that over the years. But let me, let me tell you what we're, what we're advocating as a part of the ACDC. So if you want to scroll down just a little bit for me, keep these uh, stage gates here, these bars across the top. So what you see is these colored bars. This represents what I like to call a normative career arc. You guys have all been in long enough to know no two careers follow the same path. Everybody's career goes a little bit differently. You know, some go forward, forward, back, forward, forward, others here to there to there to here to here. To, who knows? It gets weird. But when these chiefs got together and they started making this, they said, okay, in a very generalized, stereotyped way, this is the path a airman's career is gonna follow. And so we start over here. We've got this continuum of stripes, and above it are these gates, stage gates that line up with them. Some of these are hard gates, and some of these are soft gates. A soft gate means I can open this gate and walk through it, even if I don't complete the task, okay? Can you, we've got between staff sergeant and tech sergeant, we've got deployment. Is it possible to make technical sergeant without deploying first? Yeah, yeah it is, soft gate. So it is possible to move beyond it without doing it. Ahead of, ahead of that first stripe, we have BMT. Are you ever gonna put on that first stripe if you don't complete basic training? No, that's a hard gate. You pay the toll or you don't go forward. So this is a combination, soft and hard gates across this continuum, and they generally line up to these stripes. And so the way that this becomes valuable to us is we read it two ways. When we're young, when we've got a small number of stripes, we can sit here as a senior airman looking forward and go, okay, what's coming at me? What are the opportunities? What's down the road? Get a little bit of essay for ourselves. So I can look forward and go, OJT trainer. Okay, I can see myself doing that. Seven level, yeah, I want to be a seven level someday. Supervisor, yeah, I wouldn't mind supervising people. NCOIC, deployment, okay, this is what the future holds. These are the things I should be thinking about. Am I going to be effective in these roles? Am I going to be ready to do these things? And if you feel like for any reason you're not, you need to step back and go, how do I get ready? Maybe it's talking to a supervisor, because you don't know. Somebody help me out, show me the way. Maybe it's through college classes, maybe it's through military training, maybe it's a different answer for everybody. But the idea is that you've got that essay going forward. Now for those of us that have been around for a while, there's a lot of value in reading this from right to left. There's not a lot to read to the, the left anymore. But if, if I'm sitting here and I'm a master sergeant, 
And that, it's hard to read it, but that really dark purple one up there, that's uh, Senior Enlisted Joint Professional Military Education. It's uh, one and two, it's a two-parter. Uh, so if I'm sitting there at that master stripe, and I'm looking forward, I'm like, okay, I think I'm ready for senior. I think I'm ready to make that move. Validate yourself. Am I ready? Have I, have I done all the things that are gonna prepare me? And look back, you go, special duty assignment, first sergeant. You know, I always wanted to do that, never did it. Uh, NCOIC, now I was never an NCOIC, or supervisor, or trainer. I was in a one-man shop, it didn't happen. Um, ALS, okay, I did ALS. And then you start to realize, you go, huh, if I put on that next stripe and now I'm accountable for other people, that's gonna be a new experience for me. That's something I haven't, my military career has not prepared me to do. And so maybe you need to start looking for opportunities to gain that experience, to get that perspective under your belt. That's the value of reading left to right, right to left. Works the same way down here, this next section, leadership competencies. These again are, are lined up to generally correlate to where they're most valued uh, in the enlisted force. And everything's a little bit different from career to career, person to person. So we look at our, our airman tier and we see written comm, oral comm, creativity, awareness. Okay, these are great qualities that we expect to see in our airmen. We expect them to be building them and developing them while they're here. As they move forward, we're starting to look for other things. You know, we want them to say, okay, vision, leveraging diversity, building a team. Okay, it's hard to build a team as a one striker, right? You just don't have a lot of opportunity to do that. But as you progress, those opportunities come along. Now, it may be that you've got your two stripes, you're sitting here, written comm, oral comm, creativity, and on the outside, you're a CPA. So that financial management piece, you feel pretty good about. Okay, that happens. You're gonna check some boxes that are pretty far forward at times. That's okay. That's what you're bringing to the fight. Everybody's bringing something a little bit different. This is just a, a way to gain some awareness on what that is and spark some good conversations between you and your supervisor. Similarly to the stage gates above, we're gonna read from right to left at times as well. And so here I am, I'm that master sergeant again. I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna make a great senior maybe six months from now, just getting ready, getting ready. Let's see, am I, am I ready to be a superintendent? Let me look back. Um, decisiveness, I'm, I'm not that decisive, okay. Conflict management, I, I win paper, scissor, rank almost every time I play and I'm good. Um, flexibility, I can be flexible when I'm ordered to be. You start getting this picture of, you know, maybe there's some things that I need to work on. Maybe there's some perspectives that are gonna benefit me if I can gain them now. So then you gotta assess, how do I gain these perspectives? Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to do to help build myself into the leader I wanna be? Go ahead and scroll down for me. The, the last piece of this, uh, there's a little block, and I, I love this block because this is the most Air National Guard thing ever. Describe your non-military experience, positions, and responsibilities. So active duty doesn't care. But in the Guard, we're a different animal. And, and I point this out for a very specific reason. Years ago, I had an opportunity. I did a, a tour of duty out at the Air Force Research Lab as a project manager. Really incredible place. You know, get out there if you ever get the chance. But one of the, one of the folks I worked with was a guy named Matt Caffrey, retired 06 colonel. He ran the War Games uh, division out there. And one day he figured out I was in the Air National Guard. He goes, oh, Brandon, Brandon, um, I, I didn't realize you were in the Guard. He goes, that's fantastic. He goes, let me tell you a story about when I first discovered that the Guard was a thing. And I'm going, oh no, here we go. And uh, he looks at me, he goes, sometime back in the 70s, and I, was, I was new to a base, went to a party to get to know some people, and uh, started talking to this guy. He's like, he's like, yeah, actually not from this unit, I'm from the uh, Air Guard unit up the road somewhere. Alabama, Mississippi, something like that. He's like, oh, okay, I've heard of the Air National Guard, that's a thing. So, uh, um, what do you do? He's like, he's like, oh, I fly the F-4 Phantom. Awesome, awesome. What, uh, uh, that guard though, you have like a civilian job, you do something else on the outside, right? And the guy says, yeah, I run a railroad. The guy kind of laughs, he's like, I love trains. Are you a uh, conductor or an engineer? He's like, no, I'm, I'm the chief operating officer of the Norfolk Southern Railroad. Whoa, that's some big time stuff right there. So Caffrey says, he goes, so I looked at him, I said, 
okay, that, that's huge. What are you doing as a major flying planes in the guard? The guy kind of laughs and goes, not a lot of opportunity to fly fighter jets in the railroad business. Fair enough. Caffrey gets this real serious look and he looks at me and goes, Brandon, let me tell you, that's when I discovered that whenever I'm talking to a guardsman, their uniform lies to me. Their rank lies to me. Their AFSC lies to me. There's this whole other person, this whole other set of skills, knowledge, and ability that the guardsmen are bringing into the fight that their uniform doesn't tell you about. When you're talking to a guardsman, you got to actually get to know them because their uniform will not tell you everything you need to know about that person and what they're bringing to the fight. I can tell you right now, I don't think I've ever been so proud to be in the Air National Guard. It's like, That's right. That's damn right. That's who we are. That's who your troops are. So make sure you engage them on that as well. Make sure that they're thinking about who they are and what they're bringing to the fight. Not just what they've been trained to do militarily, but all of those skills, because that's still a part of them, no matter what they're wearing that particular day. All right, let's go ahead and scroll down. Smart goals worksheet. All right, refresh my memory. Who, who's familiar with the concept of smart goals? All right, about half. So what we've done, we've taken that, that concept of SMART goals, and we said, let's build it out as a worksheet. And I'm gonna caveat this. This worksheet is for the person that has never heard of SMART goals, doesn't know how to write them, has never done it. Some of you have done this for your civilian employers. Um, some of you have done it other places. Some of you, when you write a goal, it's basically in this format from the beginning because that's how you know how to write goals. You don't need to follow this step by step every time you make a SMART goal if you're already making SMART goals. This is for the guy that's doing it for the very first time. So what we do is we break it down and we say, why do we call them SMART goals? It's not just to contrast them with dumb goals, although that can be fun, but it's because SMART is an acronym for us. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time Framed. These are the components of a well-written goal that's gonna help us accomplish itself. What does specific mean? All right, I, I hate to say, specific means we're not gonna be vague. Specific means I'm gonna tell you exactly what it is I want to do. What's measurable? Measurable is, did I do it or not? It can be binary, it can be that simple. Did this get done or did this not? It can be a percentage. Did I score this percent? It can be a lot of things, but at the end of the day, the concept here is, we have some way of saying, did I meet the measure or did I not? Attainable. If you set a goal for yourself that you can't reach, I mean, I, I, I get it, right? We, we all saw like the posters in the library when we were kids. Reach for the stars, shoot for the moon, all this stuff, it's cool. We, aspirations are great, but if we're setting a goal that we can't actually reach, we're not helping ourselves. So we wanna make sure this is something we can do. It's all right if it pushes us. It's all right if it stretches us a little bit, okay? But don't set the bar so far out there that it's impossible to achieve. I'm gonna be the next Command Chief Master Sergeant in the Air National Guard by the age of 25. No, you're not. Can't get enough time in grade. Can't get enough time in service. Not attainable. Love where your head's at, love the ambition but the goal has to be achievable. Relevant. It is possible to set a really fantastic goal that doesn't actually advance you in the direction you want to go. I want to get a 90 on my next PT test. How am I going to do it? Well, you know, I'm working at a bakery right now, and uh, if I can get promoted to manager at that bakery, maybe, maybe head tester, something like that, pretty sure that's a step forward for me. So I'm pretty sure that makes everything better in my life. Except it has no bearing on your PT test. In fact, working at a bakery may have a negative outcome for your PT test, but it just has to be related. And I know that sounds goofy, trust me. At some point we have all come up with a goal where we step back usually very quickly go, oh yeah, that's not what I'm trying to do. So keep it, keep it on target. And finally, time framed. We're Americans. If we don't have a deadline, it doesn't get done. It gets pushed off to the side in favor of the thing that does have a deadline. So let's make sure 
that we put a timeline on there and we say, look, yeah, I'm gonna do this and this is the cutoff. This is when I have to have it done by. All right, let's go ahead and scroll down to the examples. So like I said, this sheet is designed for if you don't know what a SMART goal is, it's gonna teach you. So we've got a whole bunch of examples in here. I'm gonna to go to number two, it's in white. I will be a great teacher. <laughs> Good for you, that's great. That's an aspirational statement, that's not a goal. Okay. It's an aspirational statement because it's what you want, but it's not gonna help you get there. So if we write, rewrite that as a SMART goal, it could look something like, I will attend at least four educational faculty development lectures over the next 12 months and regularly employ at least one skill that I learn. Is it specific? I'm gonna go to four of these things. Okay, yep, I'm gonna attend four of these things. That's specific. Is it measurable? Well, I went to three, I didn't do it. I went to five, I had or exceeded it. Yeah, I can measure that. Did I do it or not? Is it attainable? Look, I'm not a teacher. I've never been to a faculty development lecture. Four of them over 12 months sounds doable to me. So I'm gonna say, yeah. Is it relevant? Great teacher, excellent teacher, educational faculty development, sounds on target. And is it time frame? Right, right at the end, 12 months, boom. This is a goal that's gonna push us towards achieving it. It's a SMART goal. Go ahead and scroll uh, to the second page for me. All right, there's a little bit of philosophy in here. Go ahead and scroll to writing and effective. Those at the top. It really talks about the specificity pieces, the who, what, why, when, where. Um, other suggestions. There's one on here that I'm gonna take a little step back from it. It really talks about starting your goals with two. And there's kind of this silent implication when you start a goal with two, it's, it's you're kind of whispering, my goal is to run a marathon in under four hours. That's how they advocate it personally, personal preference. I like to start them with I will. It's a little bit of an affirmation in addition to setting the goal. What you do is a matter of personal choice, it's up to you most important thing is that we have goals. And then we go down into an activity. Let me scroll. So the activity is, it starts out with an initial statement. This is that aspirational statement. Just whatever's on your mind, get it out. I want to be an excellent teacher. Blah. Put it on the page. All right? The next section is where we're going to take that statement and we're going to turn it into a SMART goal. Right? Okay, so we're going to look at that statement. We're going to say, is it specific? If it's not, I'm going to add the specificity. Is it measurable? If there's no measure in there, I'm going to figure out what my measure is. And this is where I go back to this sheet, this form, is intended as a guide for somebody that hasn't done this before. If you look at your blah statement and go, well, it's already specific, measurable, attainable, relevant time frames, you're done. Don't decompose it and then rewrite it just for the sake of satisfying the form. But if you look at it and go, well, yeah, it's specific, yeah, it's attainable, yeah, it's relevant, yeah, it's time frame, oh, I, I didn't include a measure. Okay, then rework it, put the measure in there, and you're good to go. Like I said, you do four or five of these, five or six of these, you know what your, you know what your big goals are, you know what you're working on over the course of the next two years. And if you accomplish any of those, they become ready-made bullets for that EPR. Let me take a step back. I keep talking about the EPR. I keep talking about getting through that process. This isn't about having great EPRs. This is about having great progression. This is about having great accomplishment. This is about all of the things that make the EPR great. The EPR is just the, the cherry on the top. It's the validation. This is about developing our people. This is about them having something they can achieve, some meaningful work that they can point to and go, I did that. Because if they can do that, number one, they feel better about everything that they're doing. Number two, our mission is getting accomplished. And number three, it's getting accomplished well. That's the point of this, is it's driving all of those things. We're just doing it through the ACA EPR cycle. Because that's what it was intended to do all along. Go ahead and scroll up for me. I think this is the end. Yep. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, it's done. All right, switch over to the, the most. It's that third tab. Now, like I said, I think everybody in here has seen the most in some form. This is final form. And it's gonna look different than what some of you have seen in the past. 
So go ahead and scroll for me until we get to it. One thing that was identified when we were meeting with airmen and talking to our focus groups is that the ACA is just this hodgepodge of a conversation for a lot of people. Hey, how you doing? Doing all right. How's your followership? I don't know. Eh, yeah, you pretty much do what you're told. I guess you're five. They walk out of there going, I don't know why I just did that. It was a waste of 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long they spent on it. The most is now a conversation guide for the ACA. This is a precursor to the ACA. We do this. This is not an official Air Force document. This is a supervisor's notes. The supervisor can then take those notes and fill out a meaningful ACA. So that's all explained up here in directions for use, what it is, what it's not. And let's go ahead and scroll down and take a look at the actual form itself. <clears throat> all right, so when we start the form, those of you that remember like numeric scoring and weighted drop downs and all that stuff, greatly simplified. What we see here is we've got a header. Okay, top left, maintaining a quality individual. Component of that header, we're talking about things related to personal growth. And then we've got our elements. Our elements are gonna look pretty familiar to a lot of you, and that's what aspect of personal growth are we talking about? We're talking about military education and training. How does the Little Brown Book, how does the, how does the Air Force define military education and training in terms of our development? They define it as pursues and completes required AFSC training, seeks expanded relevant technical training and knowledge, including continuation of training tasks, completes available PME such as ALS and NCOA, takes advantage of special duty assignments when and if available, progresses towards an associate's degree through the community college of the Air Force, earns and maintains military slash civilian credentials if required for AFSC. That's military training and education as it's defined by the Air Force. It's a little different than, yep, got my five level. That's why this is in here, is to make sure we're talking about all of the components, all of the things that we're supposed to be talking about with our airmen. Because looking, looking at Winston and saying, yep, you got your five level, you're good to go, that's not the same thing as sitting down and having an actual meaningful conversation about, all right, let's talk about comprehensively the training that you're doing. And if we get to the end of this and go, is it enough? He goes, no, I want more. That's good for me to know as a supervisor, too. Or if he says, you know what, I'm, I'm burnt out on this. That's good for me to know. Either way, this is meant to be conversational. This is back and forth. Scroll on down for me. Let's take a look at another one or two. <clears throat> Let's go on down to a different section. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. All right, right here. Back up to the dark one. Effectively leading people. Let's scroll down. I keep, I keep mentioning followership, so let's look at that. Go one more. Keep, keep going. All right, demonstrated followership. All right, this is one that you see on the ACA. Followership. And you pick a box, right? So scroll down just a bit for me. What does the Little Brown Book, what does the Air Force tell us followership actually means? can express the commander's vision and champions unit, Air Force, and DOD programs and policies. Okay, I want to break that down. Willingly owns, explains, and promotes leaders' decisions, champions social readiness, and promotes team building and networking activities that can impact morale and unit effectiveness. Well, that's a little different. Enthusiastically supports and explains and promotes leaders' decisions, and seeks ways to innovate and improve processes. Well, that almost sounds like questioning the status quo. That's a little bit different from followership. Provides feedback. Okay. That's meaningful. Scroll down. So if you're asking them, if you're telling them, yeah, you just you do what you're told pretty good, that's not the same thing as what they're actually meaning. Effectively interacts with positions of higher rank and authority. Accepts responsibility when it's offered, seeks it otherwise seeks responsibility and authority. That's part of followership. That's why we do this. These concepts are so much more complex than most of us as supervisors have been willing to give, uh, give time and acknowledgement of over the years. We want to make sure that we're on target because if the conversation I have about this is more likely to produce some kind of a meaningful outcome for my airmen 
than if I just say, yep, you do what you're told, check the box. At the end of the day, this is a notes form. This is a conversation guide and a notes form. Your ACA is the official document. Whatever your takeaways as a supervisor are, this will capture them for you, but then you're plugging them in to your ACA. All right, go ahead and go back to the ACDC. And go ahead and scroll down for me. <clears throat> Keep on going. So we already talked about all this. You guys, if you want uh, in-depth explanation of what the tools are, that is section two. When we get down here to section three, in practice. All right, so we've talked about the path, right? We talked about that wheel, what that looks like and what we're trying to do. We talked about the tools that are a part of it. This is section three, this is the implementation of that. This is how we actually pull this off. So number one, process begins just got assigned a major change in responsibilities, a change in units, something like that. You'll notice down the left hand column, these are color coded to match the bubbles on the wheel. We go down to two. Okay. So we've got this new troop. We're going to explain to them these are your expectations. This is what I expect of you. These are the responsibilities. These are the big rocks and things I'm expecting you to own. We're going to outline that in block eight. Block nine, a little bit of supervisors, philosophical thoughts, words of encouragement, and so forth. Had a question once, thought it was a fantastic question. What happens if we're eight months into this and my supervisor changes? Very fair question. As a subordinate, where do my where do the expectations of me come from? They come from my supervisor. If my supervisor just changed, what else may be changing? Expectations. So this could be subject to change if you change supervisors. Supervisor may also look at it and go, Nope, that's exactly what I need you doing. I will tell you right now, this purple block, this is the hardest piece of the entire wheel. Because as supervisors, as NCOs, as NCOICs, this requires us to A, understand everything that we are responsible for, which sounds at the same time incredibly simple and really scary. But we have to understand everything that we are accountable and responsible for, number one. And number two, we have to be able to break this up and delegate it to our people. We talk about people having meaningful work. Where does it come from? It comes from giving them work to do. You come out here, you don't want to sit on your butt. You come out here, you don't want to watch the, the Browns or the Bengals on TV. You might not want to watch that for a number of reasons, but in particular, it's because you're supposed to be working. You're here to contribute. There is a mission, the mission needs done, you want to be a part of it, that's why you joined the guard. We're going to break up our work and we're going to put some of it in your hands to get it done. Go ahead and scroll for me. So number three, number three is our, uh, our goal setting, right? So we're going to base it at least in part on that 174, those, those expectations that we've been given. And then we're going to take our enlisted scorecard. We're going to look at ourselves in terms of a military career. And say, okay, where do I fall on this? How does this look for me? We're going to turn around, we're going to do our SWOT analysis. That's going to include our military career, but it's going to go broader than that. And we're going to say, okay, okay. What is my operating picture? What is, what is out there for me, either positive, negative, within, without? Number three, okay, if they've got an ACA or an EPR, okay, you might want to take a look at it. When you set those goals, see if there's anything you want to carry over. Number four, informed by all of those tools, the member's going to pull out that SMART goals worksheet, and they're going to create their goals. Don't go crazy. If you have, if you have 18 goals, I'm going to tell you right now, it's almost impossible to focus. Your ideal target is probably somewhere around six over a two year span, okay? You're an A1C, you're brand new, okay, it might be less than that. Then around a little bit longer, okay, maybe it's seven. But don't overwhelm yourself. And I do wanna call out something about goals. I think there's a very common misunderstanding. Not every goal is I will win the entire war all by myself. A lot of times the goal is I have a PMI schedule, I'm gonna complete all of my PMIs, on time. That's a goal. That's contributing to the mission. That's still meaningful work. A lot of times we, we get so hung up on the idea that these goals have to be something enormous that it feels insurmountable. We do want some of them to push us. We do want some of them to stretch us. That's fine. But we also need to make sure we're doing the job we were hired to do and getting the mission taken care of. 
day in and day out. And that, that leads to good goals in and of itself. Supervisors play an active role in goal setting, especially for your younger airmen, your, your newer troops. Help them see how they contribute. Help them see what their piece of it is. 174 is gonna answer a lot of those questions for you, but walk them through it. And then finally, I've got a note up here, we're gonna scroll down to three. Um, I had somebody say this to me once, and go, well, all right, I get it, I get it, goals are great. What if, what if they're an A1C and they're a drill status guardsman? Okay. So what if they are an A1C and they're drill status guards? Well, I can't, they, they can't, there's nothing they can do. Then why are they here? If we can't take our shop, take our work, and break that up and share a piece of that, if we can't put something meaningful in somebody else's hands, then why are they here? Either A, we are failing as supervisors, B, they're just such a bad troop that we can't trust them, or C, we need to reevaluate if that position should exist. One of those three things is going on, and it's a red flag no matter what. If you have a position in the Ohio Air National Guard, we need to be able to give you meaningful work to do. You need to be able to set and achieve goals over a two year period. Scope, size, that's all gonna vary. But we've got to engage our folks. I, I, I swear, one of the things that keeps me up at night, I don't sleep that well, but one of the things that keeps me up at night is this, this chronic belief, this chronic thought that at all times we are one generation of poorly trained airmen away from losing all leadership competency in the NCO Corps. If I fail to develop Urian, if I fail to make him a competent, capable, skilled NCO, then what kind of airmen are, is he going to develop after him? He's not going to have the tools. We owe it to not only the next generation of NCOs, but to all of the ones that follow to make sure that we are doing our job, letting them learn, letting them work, letting them achieve, and facilitating that along the way. That's gonna roll us into number four. Number four, that's our performance period, right? That's where we're out there, we're, we're actually knocking, knocking out these blocks, doing these things, doing the all day, every day work too. Targets of opportunity as they present themselves but this is what we're working on. We come out of this roughly a year later, right, give or take, at the ACA. How do we do our ACA? First of all, we sit down, we take our most. Member takes their copy, supervisor takes their copy. Okay? I'm gonna fill it out about, about my member, my member's gonna fill it out about themselves. We're gonna come together and we're gonna talk about the differences. If I think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread when it comes to public speaking and presenting, and I sit down with Chief Dumas, he's like, Bose, you're terrible at this. Nobody wants to hear a word you have to say. Some of you may be sympathetic right now, I get it. But we need to talk about why that is, because one of two things is happening. Either A, I, I, I'm just glorifying myself. Oh, I'm so good, and I'm missing opportunities to improve. Or B, I'm a lot better than he thinks I am, and he needs to know why that is. So if I come to him, I go, well, you know, this, 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 I, I did this conference and I got rated this, I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that. Or I might go, no, I'm great. And he goes, except for this. Oh yeah, except for that. What about this? Oh yeah, and that. Remember this? Oh yeah, that was pretty bad. But the idea is we walk out of there on the same page. We walk out of there on the same page because honesty is where we grow. So we fill out the most. What do we do? Supervisor then takes the most, and that discussion, and that becomes their notes for filling out that ACA. And scroll for me. Okay, we also, when we do that, we fill out the ACA, because that's a major benchmark, the ACA, the EPR, we're gonna pull out the scorecard, we're gonna pull out the SWAT, all the other documents that we've developed, the 174, and we're just gonna give them a quick walkthrough. Okay, how are you coming on your goals? Well, th these two are done, this one I think isn't gonna happen anymore. Okay, tell me why. Okay, anything change on your scorecard? You know, I feel better about this than I used to, okay. Again, engagement between the subordinate and the supervisor. Go ahead and scroll for me. <clears throat> All right, you see it in note one. The process is designed to be discussion driven. All right, go ahead and scroll um, down, put six at the top. 
All right, six, back into our perform, right? Come out the other side of our ACA, we go into our performance cycle, we start knocking out blocks, performing, that brings us to our EPR. How are we doing our EPRs now? Cool, it's not this random, oh God, I showed up to drill and I've got two people with EPRs due. No, we knew this was coming. We've been building towards this for two years. How have we been building towards it? Well, we've got SMART goals. Let's take a look at our SMART goals and see if our member knock, knocked any of them out of the park. Easy bullets. Let's take a look. Um, let's pull out their, their ACA. Let's pull out their most, those notes. Let's take a look and see what, our, see what has changed since then and what has stayed the same. Pull out the enlisted scorecard. Pull out all of, that doc, all of those documents. Talk to your member about them. And then we're going to fill out that EPR. And then when we do fill out that EPR, that is an automatic trigger to consider, should I be writing an achievement medal, an Air Force Commendation medal, or an MSM? Is something merited? Got all the information in front of you. There's no better time to make that decision than when it's all laid out right in front of you. Go ahead and scroll down for me. All right, there were only seven bubbles as we went around that wheel, but you'll notice there's an eighth up here. That's because our process starts over. It's been two years. Let's take a look at that 174 again. Is it still what we want to be working on? Cool, stamp it, it's good to go again. You got changes you need to make? Make them, brief the member, life goes forward. It's a continuous cycle, it's a process. Let's scroll down. All right, this is what we are trying to do. We are implementing this, this is a 179th Com Flight product got picked up by MSG, got picked up by the wing. Um, right now it has interest above and beyond that, we'll see where that goes. But we are doing this because we want to make sure that we are developing our people. We are growing into the leaders that we need to be to take care of folks and address new missions, new opportunities, and keep kicking ass. 179th Airlift Wing is a great unit. We're gonna keep it a great unit but it only stays that way as long as we as NCOs keep preparing airmen to lead in the future. If you guys have any questions, I'll stick around. Thanks.